All right, folks are going to be coming in, and so we'll be letting folks let you know when to start. And you'll kick us off, right, Dan? Yeah, I'll kick you okay. off. Starting off. Okay, well, it looks like we might get a couple late comers, but we'll go ahead and get things started. Uh, welcome everyone to our, tonight's event with uh, Daniel Krauss, or the, the for author of, of The Living Dead with, oh, I should say co-author with George A. Romero. And uh, he's in conversation today with Colleen O'Haran, my colleague from the Seattle National Film Festival. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, just a few notes, we are recording this, um, so please be on your best behavior. <laughs> and if you know a friend who, who is going to, who has unfortunately missed this, we will be posting it to YouTube later on. Um, also, uh, feel free to, to use the chat, but if you have a question for Daniel, please use the, the Q&A tab at the bottom and we'll go through those. And if I see any questions in the, in the chat, I'll ask you to just kind of move them over to the Q&A, if you would. Um, and with that, I want, let's, we'll go ahead and get things started. Let me introduce uh, our folks tonight. Um, we are, oh, oh, lost my script there. I'm sorry about this. All right. Well, tonight we are honored to be joined by uh, Daniel Krauss, who is a New York Times bestselling author. With Guillermo del Toro, he co-authored The Shape of Water based on the same idea the two created for the Oscar winning film. Also with Del Toro Cross co-authored Troll Hunters, which was adapted into the Emmy Award winning Netflix series. Cross's The Death and Life of Zebulon Finch was named one of Entertainment Weekly's top 10 books of the year. And he won two Odyssey Awards for both Waters and Scholar and has been a Library Guild selection, YALSA Best Fiction for Young Adult selection. And more important for uh, me and Colleen, he was a Bram Stoker Award finalist. And he, Tonight, today he'll be um, in conversation with Colleen O'Halloran. Uh, she is the programmer for a SIF's WTF light, lineup, and she can tell you what exactly that means. She's been the head of that for, since 2017. And she is also the curator for SIF's What the Femme Education series, which is a really great series. And if you want to catch up on that, they are available on demand through the SIF website, which is SIF.net. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get things started. Colleen, go ahead and kick things off. Thanks, Dan. And, um, you know, I'm actually going to start with a question, Daniel, that as we were preparing for the interview, uh, it was hard not to ask you <laughs> um, because it, it's just, I think it will help us kind of set the stage a little bit. But can you walk us through the history of the book's development? How did this opportunity get to you? And in what phase was the book mm -hmm. at that point? Yeah, it's, it seems as if I just dreamt it, and <laughs> the whole thing, uh, uh, it's still sort of unreal. Um, but uh, essentially, I'm going to try to make this the short version, because the very, very long version is in the back of the book at the, in the author's note. Um, the short version is that uh, about a month after George died in 2017, um, I got a call from his manager and his wife. Uh, saying that they were kind of going through the uh, materials that he was working on, you know, around the time, the time that he died. And there was this uh, epic, epic novel that he was, that he hadn't finished. And they were wondering if I would um, be interested in trying to complete it. And so that, you know, makes you wonder, well, why me? Why did they, they call me? Um, I mean, part of me still doesn't really understand why, but I did come off those couple of co collaborations with Guillermo del Toro. So I did have that going for me. Um, and just as important, his manager knew what a student, he, kn he knew me and knew what a student I was of Romero's work. Um, 
and importantly, not just his zombie films, but really mm. just just all of his mm. his stuff, and that I really um, uh, that it meant a lot. To me. uh, Romero was my my favorite artist in, of any kind of type of media, really. And I'd seen I Living Dead at age five or six, and um, it just it, Romero was sort of my uh, origin story as a mm. as a writer and an artist, really. So. Um, so yeah, this is not the, the the chance to sort of be part of the end and the Living Dead. The book does sort of offer an ending to the um, zombie saga. Mm. Uh, to be part of an end of something that really was the beginning of what started me as an artist was too much to even consider saying no. Um, so I said, you know, of course, yes, right away. Uh, and that wasn't the end of it. I had to kind of come up with what I thought. The, the what shape the book would take um because you know there was a lot of questions about the manuscript and what wasn't there what should be there um but that's how it kind of started and so did you know at that point that romero had been working on a novel um a little bit every once in a while uh over the last like decade of his life in an interview he mentioned that he's working on a novel uh it it wasn't a subject that people tended to cry about you know I think mm. movie people tend to be interested in movies um and so there's never a lot of information on what it was but but I didn't know this over the year a couple times that he would mention that and that but that was it so I didn't I didn't think much of it wow and and just I um I, I'm curious too when you say you know you were interested in Romero's whole body of work um when and I um am you know really interested in the themes that you that you brought forth in The Living Dead that are certainly throughout the dead films. But in terms of like, like some kind of continuous narrative or connection, do you think, like, do you see themes like outside of the dead films in Romero's work that are similar to what you worked on in this book? Yeah, I mean, part of the, the goal was to, because I didn't have George, was to create, you know, a sort of analog, AI George and to try to figure out as much as I could about what he thought about things. Some of them were very mm -hmm. obvious. Some of them required digging into the work to get a sense of um, it when there's a sort of a narrative fork in the path, you know, which direction would he take? Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't necessarily, because I was going to have to be a, a full on collaborator here, I wouldn't necessarily always have to take the road he would take. Um, but I wanted to know what that road was. And, and generally, we're pretty copacetic with our, our worldviews. Um, so yeah, there was, there was much to be, to be plumbed from um, his, other, his mm -hmm. other films. It, it certainly doesn't behoove one to only look at his zombie films, particularly mm -hmm. because those were the films that, even though they're brilliant, those are the films that he was kind of forced to make after a while. You know, like mm -hmm. the, the films were his, his favorite for the other movies. You know, those rare chances that he got to make Knight Riders or Martin or even things like Bruiser, which is a film he really loved. So uh, it was important to see what, you know, when the sort of zombie shackles were off of mm. him, what, what were his tendencies? And I think just because I recently have been exploring his the non-zombie films too, there's a real patience with the storytelling and, you know, something like Martin and... Um, even Night Riders, you know, just lots of like kind of um, in terms of like just the human conversations, right? Like getting to know the people and like the dynamics with one another, which maybe isn't a theme as much as just a common thread. Um, yeah. But, but I'm, I'm wondering like, what are, you know, when you wrote this book, when you did the, you know, the research, when you picked it up, how much of the sort of storytelling or your AI Romero was tied to the times, like Romero in the 60s versus Romero in 2009? And how, like, did, did you see the AI Romero kind of changing through time? Was it hard to kind of pin down a common mm -hmm. thread for something as like central as a novel? Uh, not really. I mean, he was, I and I think most of us are, uh, for better or for worse, once we, are adults, we kind of have a viewpoint and it, you know, generally tends to hold out. Uh, I think he essentially was the same person, you know, in his seventies as he was at 17, you know, he had, he had certain 
strong beliefs and he had moments i think in time as we all do when he got um when there was something new it'd, it'd often be technological where you would get excited about some new sort of opportunity in life um but generally uh they would not work out and he would sort of bounce back to um sort of the viewpoint he had before i mean the the example i'm thinking of course is the the internet which he was very uh, idealistic about when first at first it became something everyone was excited about around around the year 2000 when it really seemed like there was a a moment where it could really revolutionize um artists getting their work out to the people without the middleman for romero the middleman was really hollywood um which, which he had a very rocky relationship with um so yeah so he thought that would that was great he had his website he was going to release his next movie straight to the fans and uh you know but his website had forums and the, the trolls came out and very very quickly very very quickly he shut down and he he kind of saw 20 years in the future in 20 seconds you know and said oh this is not good the the anybody here can get on can have a pulpit can have uh a soapbox and it seems like the more extreme that they are the more people kind of listen to them uh so he pulled the plug on that it's interesting too because it it really is like you know so many um like this story and so many of the stories of the characters in the living dead are like microcosms of how humanity um interacts right and and you talking about the internet is it's like that is a perfect example of how we find we like seek out conflict as humans um and you know uh, in the living dead we you know we follow the protagonists and we get to know their their backstories and who they are and um and you really make these characters like people um who we know but um as much as we feel i think like the optimism and you know rooting for our characters there's always that sort of reminder of um, that kind of thematic, uh, pessimistic view. So I'm wondering, how do you balance that? Like the optimism of like people and all that's hopeful about them. And then the pessimism or cynicism of like what humans can get up to, especially in stress. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's a hard one. You know, I think from the very beginning, I'm talking, uh, mid early mid 60s so pre night living dead um he he's he's he uh, essentially sketched out what the first three zombie films would be and they were they were really about an uprising and that makes big sense in the context of the 60s that there would be this sort of zombie that the, the zombie story was a story about uh, a sort of uh, uh, an underclass that was rising to topple a rotten ruling class. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a, I don't, I mean, you can look at that and say, yeah, that's a cynical story. Or you can say it's a really hopeful story, you know, and even, and if you watch the individual zombie films, while they are sort of progressively about the zombies slowly kind of taking over, um, it doesn't mean he, he doesn't love the characters that are, are struggling i think you can you can sort of love mm. the, the the it's like hate hate the game not the player i don't know i don't know what kind of metaphor i'm making but but it's you know you can love the people struggling in it even if you know that the society that they're enmeshed in is is um rotten in a way mm. And like in terms of these characters, the characters who we get to know so well in the book, how how well formed were they when they came to you? Do you feel like you had to get to know people who already existed, or did you um, really develop who they were and how they would live in the world? It really depended on the character. Uh, some of them were pretty well sketched out, like the people who work in the morgue. The, those characters were, were very fleshed. Um, there were uh, other characters who were much thinner. There were there were ca entire characters who didn't exist at all, you know. And it was a matter of me looking at 
the pieces that exist, which were all over the place. It wasn't like he wrote half the book and stopped. They were just, there was a piece here and a piece here. And, and so part of the, the effort was making the connective tissue. And that, in, that involved doing a lot of invention, you know, like we need a new character here. We need a support here. We need an entire whole system of characters over here. Mm. Um, so it, it, it varied greatly. Interesting. And, you know, well, I understand that you received like a nine page letter or you found a nine page letter that Romero had written that talked about the trajectory mm -hmm. of some of these characters after you were 400 pages in. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about how you, how that was a, yeah. for you? There was a lot of occurrences like that. And it felt like George was really out there like he was just at home on his computer and occasionally he'd send me something because it wasn't just a letter it was other other but batches of pages and other stuff that came in different stages when i was working um so it was like he was sort of a a rascally collaborator who would just like send me stuff that i'd be like oh this is great but could you have sent me this before um so but yeah the letter was a particular particularly uh annoying and uh wonderful um because i was deep into the story at that point and then we had this letter uh his manager found this letter that had all these notes about where he was going with some of the um, characters and plot lines so some of them some of them were magically aligned with what i had made up myself it was incredible right down to a he had a, he invited a fire fighter pilot named jenny and i had created a fighter pilot named jenny it was wild some of the coincidences uh, but then there were other things that like he had uh, a couple characters that he wrote went on many more adventures and I'd killed them off like, you know, 300 pages ago. Uh, so I tried to and I did this with all of his writing, whether it was notes or, or full on uh, manuscript pages. I always tried to save it in some way. So a lot of the things I was able to use just as he wanted them or intended them. And other ones I repurposed and found other ways because the material was finite. So I tried to treat it preciously and use as much of it as possible in one way or another. While still like having a true collaboration in the sense of like the story is something that is made with the two of you. That, that's yeah, it was a weird, it was a weird process, very unique, difficult. Mm. I wouldn't would never want to do it again, but it was it was fascinating. And it's interesting, you know, earlier we were talking about Romero's frustration with Hollywood. And, and I imagine, you know, and just the, like the, you know, his screenplay is starting out big and, you know, expansive and then needing to cut them down or other people cutting them down to something that can fit into a two hour film. I imagine that this novel was in some ways inspired by that yearn mm. to tell a story that could just go yeah. now this is a, a big book but what i found is that the, it moves really quickly and it, it evolves from character to character and story to story and for you and you're also someone you're no stranger to, to to big books you know the death and life of zebulon finch for example so could you talk a little bit about the length of this mm. book and how you approach like how long you wanted to make it ultimately yeah, I, I, it was always intended to be a big book. I, I, I think in some, one of his notes somewhere was that he wanted it to be a, a, a doorstop. He wanted it to be a, a sort of conversation ender in a way. I mean, there was part of him that was sick of zombies because um, that's all he could make in the last 10 or 20 years of his life. He couldn't even make another horror film. It had to be zombies. So, um, But he was also you know, grateful for them and very fond of them. Um, so uh, he wanted it to be the, the final word. And he mm. definitely wanted it to stand in the place of all the, the big movies that, that he didn't get to make. That, you know, most famously, Day of the Dead was going to be this Lawrence of Arabia of zombie mm -hmm. movies and got cut down. And so it Land of the Dead. So he had these moments, even on his slightly bigger films, that they were always getting shaved down by the, the people with the money. Uh, so this was, writing for him was really fun in that way, that he could just, you know, do anything he wanted and work on a huge canvas. But interestingly, 
and I think you can sense this in, in the book, you know, in his manuscript pages, um, the stuff that was really about the sweep of it, uh, he seemed less interested in than mm -hmm. the minute character stuff. Like that's when he would really come to life, just write pages and pages of fascinating stuff. So I think, I think a lot of artists, and it seems particularly filmmakers, but that's not true. Really any artist, they, they do have something in them, a lot of them that always wants to try to do something bigger. I, so that's certainly the case with me. Um, but that doesn't mean it's always what, what they're most effective at, you know? Like he wanted to do this huge thing, but really, you know, I think close adherence to his, his work will say like, you know, he was best when he made stuff like Martin when he mm -hmm. made Night Living Dead, you know, when he made these really small movies. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean those were his favorite to make, but those were when he was the most effective. Mm. And it, you know, it, it's interesting because there are obviously a lot of people who, you know, the, let's call them let the Romero completists, you know, who, who, who will, who have to read this. So for that audience um, who's about to, to open the book, any kind of, like context about the timeline of the films and how mm -hmm. they would expect the, um, the sort of timeline to play out? Well, the book is constructed so that it can work with the movies. So if you wanted to, and this is kind of explained in the author's note as well, you could, I'm trying to get this right. I'm not gonna get the, there's a, there's a sequence, well, why, why not? I'll just tell you what it is, because they have the page more. Because I always I get asked this question. <laughs> If you want the full experience of the chronology of everything Romero uh, wrote about the, the zombie uprising, you would want to read the first act of this book and then watch the movies in this order, Night, Diary, Survival, Dawn, Land, and Day, and then read the second and third acts of the book. So the movies kind of fit into the, into the kind of the middle of this book um so it all it all works together and it's all supposed to work together and but for, for the super fan there's there's that part of it that's kind of cool and there's all sorts of nods to the movies in the book um but also i think for the super fan you just want to know how it ends you know like there's there's ramiro all over the final pages of this book it's not like i just made up everything after a certain point um, his input is right there in the final pages and the final paragraph. So it, he had a, he had a, you know, he had his brothers about how he wanted this all to end and it's in there. Yeah, you said earlier that you were introduced to Romero at a, at a young age. I, um, and I, I know from, uh, you know, reading your author's note that it was Night of the Living Dead. What do you think it was about that film that for you as like a really young person like made such an impression that would have this kind of change the course of your life so to speak yeah and the other thing that changed my life was twilight zone and i think that the the thing was is that it just they were both easily accessible so i could see them over and over again and they were they were both so sh shocking to me in a way and for a night for, for twilight zone to get that out of the way the first episode i ever saw was this episode called the invaders which was all you had to show me because it was essentially a silent episode. There was no talk. Was that with the elderly woman and her yep. house? Yep. Yeah. And so for a kid who's probably seen, you know, kids programming and cartoons and stuff that just had nonstop noise and talking to be introduced to this creepy, silent, uh, black and white thing was jarring. It's like, I've never seen anything like this. And Night Living Dead was similar mostly in how it ended like mm. you can you can i'm gonna go ahead and spoil it here I, it's been out for 50 some years uh you can just kill the main character at the end offhandedly you know like it wasn't he died in some great sacrificial way he does everything right he's the hero of the movie and then just casually without without a care in the world just knock him off and that was, I think, so shocking as a kid mm. um, that it, it was just really impactful. Um, and that wasn't why I got into it. I was into it because my mom was into it and she liked 
you know, the camp of it. And we would laugh at Barbara's foibles and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I think what lodged in my head was uh, Ben's death. Right. There, there was like a, a unique storytelling happening there. And even Barbara's character almost just sort of falling back into the, mm -hmm. you know, into the, the background is really different than what you'd expect after you're introduced to someone in the first act like that. So the, yeah, there was, that makes sense. Yeah. You, it shocked you out of the sort of maybe expected ending or expected plot. And then you were hooked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're a kid, everything's Star Wars and He-Man, you know, it's like yeah. there are certain ways that narratives work and to, to have a main character on Barbara who fades away and this, other character who rises up becomes superhero-ish in some ways. It'd be like at the end of a, at the end of Star Wars, if when Luke got his medal at the end, a truck comes by and hits something like, yeah, it's like what? You're gonna kill him with a, a drive? You know, it just it 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 upset everything that you you thought were rules and narratives. And what you said earlier about there being like a hopefulness around that or around like the uprising, that, that's, that, that really sticks with me. It's just such a very Romero, right? Very mm -hmm. like, it's almost like inverting a happy ending in that sense of how the Night of the Living Dead, the film ended and where it left us. And then as we continue, you know, through the journey of the films, we're you know, we continue to, to find the little stories inside of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think what Ramiro was trying to tell us is a happy ending doesn't necessarily have to be a happy ending for you. Mm. You know, like there could be a happy ending that's good for society that is actually kind of not great for you, uh, but is for the benefit of us evolving as a species. Can you tell me a little bit about, so the, the, the storytelling techniques were very interesting in the book. And, um, and don't worry, listeners, we won't give any spoilers away because I know folks haven't maybe finished the book yet or picked it up. But I would love to hear more about your, your choice, Daniel, to, uh, to, to use the zombies POV. I hadn't, mm -hmm. I've never experienced anything like that before and I thought it was really refreshing and interesting. Well, I hadn't either. And the, the concept, this was, a, this was a, one example of something that was truly a mix of George and I. Um, I don't think I would have done it on my own. It, it was, it's so different than what has been in any of George's movies. But he, he instituted it in the, um, in the manuscript. He, he, he had a section from the, the zombies point of view. Um, and one of the, the things we found during the process of trying to find every bit of prose writing he'd ever done, which was very limited, is we found a short story that he'd published onto the aforementioned website um, and had been just totally lost to time. And it was from a zombie's point of view. Uh, so that short story was really helpful because um, no one had seen it in 20 years and probably only a handful of people ever saw it. Um, and it really was helpful in laying down the rules of zombies, like, you know, like can, how, do, how is their sense of smell, their sense of taste, et cetera, et cetera. It was really helpful. Um, now, what I did is I, 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 took, I took those zombie chapters and I, I turned them into sort of a group, a, a, a plural idea of all the mm. zombies kind of being of one mind. And that was based on, this is a whole other question, I won't get too, too deeply into it. That was based on a theory of mine that I came up with from studying all of his films mm -hmm. and trying to figure out where he was going. If he made he yeah. made six zombie films, but if he made six more, what was the trajectory that he was drawing? What was it teaching us? Where, where was he really going with it? So based on that, I had I realized that you know, um, and again, I'll leave this to people to explore and read the author's note. But the the idea that the that humans were a kind of a plague and that um, almost like a virus, like we're the virus and the, um, the zombies were the antibodies in a sort of way to, to come cleanse us, cleanse the world of us in a way. So you put, you put all those things together, it's all in the author's note. Uh, and um, you come up with this idea of zombies having a united purpose 
and zombies not being strictly, uh, well, I've said too much, I, but no, yes. I'm, this is awesome. Yeah. That's well, awesome. no, there's, I don't want to oh, say too much. I'm never going to see it the same again after hearing that description. I, I, that's just like the, just such a eye opener, you know, especially having like for yourself doing like the tremendous amount of research. I know you do, you know, for every book, you write, you do research, but this is your labor of love because it's something you've done from such a, a, you know, a young age, but I see what you're saying to you also want to leave it to the, to the reader to, to piece mm -hmm. together their meaning or what they see. Yeah. I mean, that's a good way to put it. I mean, at the end of the day, this is one interpretation, you know, like George isn't here. And this is, this wasn't a matter of just fixing his misspellings. Like this was a huge, uh, there's a lot to be done. So at the end of the day, this is not a George Romero book. It's a George Romero and Daniel Krauss book. There's no way around that, really. Uh, so um, the author's note sort of explains why I made the choices that I did. So somebody can sort of understand why I took the turns I did and, and can disagree with them. So I have a, just a kind of a question on technique because you are such a prolific author. I, it's astonishing how much you are able to write um any what is your like approach because you know people who are out there who are who are trying to write who are you know maybe struggling um any kind of like tips or insights into how one uh gets so many pages in um mm -hmm. well i mean for, it's going to be so different for different people. For me, it's it's definitely about not being precious about it, and not um, and just treating it like a job. You know, I just I get up early and I work all day, and um, and that's it. And and not not get stuck in, or try not to get stuck in any sort of way of thinking that I need to. I can only do it if I wake up and have this special cup of tea. And first, take a walk around the lake if you have a lake. <laughs> I don't have a lake, but you know whatever would be your your thing, and to trump it up into this like Instagram life idea mm -hmm. that I'm going to be a writer and it's going to be this this artistic thing that I can I can gaze out the window and and have this artistic life. Um, I think for me, a lot of that comes back to not being all that interested in. Uh, are less interested in a book once it's published. Like I'm really, really focused on the, the writing of the book. That's where I get all my pleasure. Um, so when, when that becomes your focus, uh, you just want to spend as much time as you can writing. Um, so just getting here and sitting down in the morning and as quickly as I can start writing. Uh, that's, that's just all, it's all I want to do. It's all I've ever, ever wanted to do. And I would, I would like to die just sitting here, right here. Uh, <laughs> working on a book it's just everything else is um, is necessary and uh has enjoyable moments for sure um and you know talking here with you is is, is so much fun uh but my first love is really just the the writing so you're kind of almost like born with it or it's something that you you say it sounds like you've been doing like writing and wanting to write from a young age similar to your love for romero the writing was also there so this was yeah, nice. but I mean, it's, it's not quite that direct, you know, like early in my career, I had a lot of the problems that a lot of people do, you know, it's like I had times in writing, it felt poisonous in some way, like I didn't feel right. Um, I, I couldn't figure out a routine that worked, you know, I had full time jobs like everyone else. And I was like, do I write morning? Do I write at night when I'm tired? You know, so there, it was, there were years of figuring out what's how am I going to make this work? What's the pattern that that works for me? Um, and for me, it was for for many many years. It was writing uh, like crazy on the weekends and spending pretty much a hundred percent of my holidays and vacation time just writing. Um, and that was enough to, to so I could at some point to sort of magically lock into a rhythm. And now it's different because I'm writing every day. But but the the process is exactly the same. It's just that. Um, instead of writing two or three days a week, I'm writing uh, six. It used to be seven, but I, I take Sundays off now. 
walk around the pond, the proverbial yeah. pond. <laughs> yeah, B building my pond. Yeah, there you go. And, and, you know, I'm sure when you were writing this book, you could have never anticipated like the pandemic that would be happening um, at the time the book was released. So um, any thoughts or reflections on on that, the timing of the, the book release and maybe how the book is, how we're perceiving it likely very different than we would have otherwise? I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, the obvious thing to, to note is that, uh, uh, well, maybe not so obvious, is that my belief is that George thought that the zombie uprising should have been containable. And this is really obvious in the remake of Night Living Dead from 1990 that George wrote, where he goes out of his way to state how easy it is to defeat zombies. You know, the characters say explicitly, oh, look, they're super slow. You know, walk right around them. Um, and at the end of the Night of the Living Dead, you get the sense that, oh, we've really got this. You know, the, the, all these people with guns come out. So what the point, the larger point he was trying to make is all we had to do was the simplest things. All we had to do was work together. That was mm -hmm. it. And I think, uh, it, then when you jump to Dawn of the Dead and zombies have taken over the world, it, uh, it might seem a little unrealistic, but then you look at, you know, what happened over the past year and you say, well, if, if we can't get people to put a mask on their face, there's no way they're, they're going to, they're going to effectively fight off zombies. Like they, they won't even socially distance. I mean, it's like he, he was right on the money that we would have, we have no shot when, when the, when the hard stuff comes down that we cannot and will not do the simple steps that it takes to keep each other safe. Cause ultimately not enough people care about. Mm. Exactly. And it's also the connectedness of humanity, like how fast I think that was one of the things people talked about, like, wow, that moves globally from a very small area. All, like we are connected, even though we don't want to cooperate, like whether we like it or not, you know, this is all, yeah. we're, we're in this yeah. together. Yeah, exactly. So we've got a couple questions from the audience and I wanna make sure we have got time to, um, to look at those. So uh, the first one here is, um, can you talk a little bit about the anti-humanism of the zombie virus? How zombie animals don't attack one another, but rather only humans. What's Romero getting at with his virus as a metaphor? Yeah, so the idea of zombie animals was, was weirdly enough, it seems sort of an esoteric idea, but it was really crucial to figuring out my interpretation of Romero's work. And it really began with when I was doing my research, I kept coming up with Romero in his last decade, being really coy about zombie animals, like in the, it wasn't like he was making a big thing of it, but occasionally someone would ask him about it or he would mention it himself on a director's commentary that he was really interested in zombie animals and that he was, he was, he didn't come out and say, I'm definitely gonna make a movie that has zombie animals, but he basically said that. He's like, yeah, it's something I'm kind of playing with and I don't wanna to say too much about. Um, and then he kind of did this comic, this sort of side comic, not canon to the, his Romero verse, but had zombies in it and they had uh, zombie animals and that. And then Land of the Dead had a, finally had a zombie animal scene that they cut out uh, for budgetary reasons before they shot. And what I was able to figure out through all of this was that um, particularly that zombie rat scene in Land of the Dead, which did make it into the, I think the, the comic book version, maybe the graphic novel version. I don't, I don't I'm not positive and I can't remember, um, but I've read the scene and the zombie rats aren't, they're not, um, they're not attacking non-zombie rats, right? So it's not a cannibalistic thing. Uh, they're attacking humans. Uh, and so you, you start to realize that, okay, if, if, if human zombies are attacking humans and rat zombies are attacking humans, this is not a cannibalistic situation. Mm. This is an anti-human uh, situation. So, then you begin to say, okay, so if, if all the animals on the planet, when they turn zombie, turn anti-human, mm -hmm. then that suggests a larger purpose to all of this. Because uh, it would not be natural for a, 
a, an undead kangaroo to go after a person? Why would it do that? So there's a, there's a bigger purpose. And so that leads us into the idea that, um, or led me anyway, to the idea that um, they're here as a force of sorts mm -hmm. to usher us out of the planet that we have destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and until that job is done, and it's, it's very natural. It is sort of like antibodies. Mm -hmm. It's very natural. They'll mm -hmm. come in, they'll eat us, they'll, they'll decimate us. We will turn into just these little pockets of humanity that are hiding in the, in the, in the shadows. And eventually with nothing to eat and no more zombies being made, they will slowly just rot and sort of f fall into the earth and fertilize the earth. And um, at that point we are cleansed and the humans can start crawling out sort of like the caveman did and, and start migrating and uh, trying again. Mm. And, and that leads a little bit into the next question here from an audience member, which is um, that, that there's a certain hopefulness um, about the ending of your book that reflects maybe a softening of Romero's outlook as he got older. Do you believe that that is the case? I don't, I don't know that I agree. Um, it's hard to say, like the, the ending of the book, and I, I won't say what it is, but it is a bit perplexing. Like it's not an ending that, that I think makes me feel really definitively one certain way. Um, even down to the last sentence, the last sentence I think is designed to, to leave you questioning. Uh, is this, like, is this positive? Is this negative? Is it both? It's, 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 it leaves you kind of off your step a little bit, which I, which I really like about it. Um, there is something, I almost kind of feel like the ending is, is pessimistic, but also beautiful, uh, which is why I think it feels kind of optimistic because it, it's, it's pretty in a way. Um, but I think that that fits into sort of my interpretation of sort where it's like, you know, where, I, and especially in, in this book where the, there's like grotesqueries sort of everywhere, but there's something, you know, I, I try to, I try to in this book and other books sort of write beautifully about disgusting things um, in the way that, you know, a rotting corpse, once it really gets into advanced stages, starts erupting these things kind of that look like flowers, like pink and yellow and purple, all these kind of things. So there is something kind of beautiful uh, about uh, rotting you know, in, a, mm -hmm. in a very kind of twisted way. Um, so I don't know, I, I, think it's, I think it's pessimistic, but I, I, I understand the optimistic viewpoint of it. It's, it's tricky. And in terms of the, you know, I'm sure you're probably asked a lot about the books you've written that have been adapted to, to films and series. Um, as far as this, like this book goes, when, you're, when you were writing it, did you picture it um, on the moving screen or did you really sort of keep focused on that like narrative fiction without any thoughts to what it might look like as a film? Definitely no thoughts. Um... Yeah, I have, when I'm writing, I have no interest whatsoever in uh, any of eventual movie or TV production. That, 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 those kind of thoughts would just be absolutely toxic to me. And you'd be writing a screenplay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, want that, so I want that stuff as far from my mind as possible. Yeah. Um, so something that, you know, if anyone has done any digging on Romero and also you, Daniel, is the fact that the Tales of Hoffman was a major influence on you both. So tell you, you, you sort of just tease this in your author's note, um, but I would like to hear more about like, what is it about this film that was so influential? Well, I mean, it, it, I, I, there's this, I wanna slightly adjust that. It wasn't formative for me. Uh, it was it was extreme. It was George's favorite film, which is a 
Holland Press for your movie version of an opera, um, which is, you know, the last thing a lot of fans would expect would be Romero's favorite film. But Romero didn't watch or read much horror at all. Um, he was sort of a turn of classic movies guy. And he was just obsessed with, with Tales of Hoffman. Uh, so um, I, of course, watched Tales of Hoffman and studied it more than any of, I mean, I studied part of my weird uh, idea of constructing sort of a fake George was to, to watch all his favorite movies and listen to his favorite music and try to figure out what inspired him about it and then try to be inspired by it uh, to figure out, okay, if he, he loved Tales of Hoffman, what can I watch from it and get inspired by Tales of Hoffman from? So I took a lot from Hoffman. Um, most dramatically, I took the structuring. Hoffman is more or less three acts. And um, I, I use that as, as a structuring element to the book and theme the act sort of in the way that I saw the Hoffman stories being themed. And then some other things that are much, much deeper buried in the book that only true tales of Hoffman fanatics will ever, ever catch. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's, it's an odd thing for Romero yeah. to love so much. So that therefore it had to be studied. Um, I don't know what else to, to say about it that wouldn't just be like only interesting to opera fiends. <laughs> uh, do you know the anecdote, uh, the Scorsese anecdote about Tales of Hoffman, Daniel? I do, I do. Do you want to tell the audience about that? Well, when he was at, when he was living in New York, he um, would constantly go to, I don't the university maybe library? The New York Public Library. Okay. And would co continually rent the film print of, uh, I assume it was a 16 millimeter film print of Tales of Hoffman. And sometimes it wouldn't be there and they would say, ah, oh, this other guy, Marty has it. And they eventually figured out it was Marty Scorsese. And it was Romero and Scorsese, you were just both sort of obsessed with the film. Uh, if go. I could jump in what, with one question. Um, what, what is the one question that you would have loved to have asked George Romero while writing the novel? Was there something oh, that was just God. kind of at the top of your mind that when you were kind of, even as you were writing the, in, you know, cruise mode on writing that you kind of would have liked to have had an answer on? I mean, I, I suppose I would have wanted to run all my crazy theories you know, like, am I right about this? What I'm, what I'm envisioning for the future, where the zombies was going? Uh, am I just totally making it up? Uh, but on the other hand, there's something magical about not being able to ask that, and to, to just kind of allow the flight of fancy um, and the interpretation of pure art without going to the artist. I mean, that's. Um, you know, like if somebody emails me, uh, like a reader emails me a question and like, I can answer it, yeah, but um, I feel like my answer is always gonna be a little disappointing. Like it's, there's something about just interpreting the art uh, that's particularly in a book where you're doing half the work, your imagination. Um, it's, it's, it feels, it almost feels like I'm, I'm robbing them of that act of engagement. I think that it might be the same case with George. I think. Uh, I wonder, I, I think with George definitively answering questions, I would have been more hesitant in a lot of ways because I would have, I would have yeah. been afraid to, to go big on, on some of the ideas. Um, so I don't have a, a good nuts and bolts answer, you know, but I, I can definitely tell you that um, it pains me to not be able to ask him if he likes, if he likes it, you know, yeah. like did, it's just that simple question. Did he like, how it turned out. Um, mm -hmm. And even just saying that makes me sad, you know, that I don't, I can have his wife say nice things about it and people know him, I say nice things, but um, to not have that sort of, you know, pat on the shoulder that you did okay, kid, you know, but it's, that's, it's leaves me slightly bereft not to have that. Daniel, we've got another question from the audience. Uh, how much did Romero influence uh, Death and Life of Zebulon Finch? Um, I, uh, 
the audience member says, I know you dissect a little bit um, of uh, Night of the Living Dead in it, but where else uh, were his influences felt? Yeah, so there's a second, the Zebulon Finch project is a two volume, gigantic um, 1500 page project. Um, and there is a section that takes place in the 60s where um, a character kind of becomes obsessed with Night of the Living Dead in the same way that Charles Manson got obsessed with the White Album. Like he thinks the film is telling him, telling him certain things. So that's sort of an explicit um, analysis of a, a weird analysis of Night of the Living Dead. Um, it's, it's harder to point to other specifics. You know, I think Romero just, Romero and Rod Serling are just so much a part of how I think um, about, and not even so much genre, like particularly Romero was sort of, you know, not drag kicking and screaming exactly, but he was he was stuck in the horror genre. Horror genre. And he was grateful for it, of course, of course, but he was stuck. Um, more just his worldview and the things that he values and the the things that he worries about, um, and generally his just feelings about humanity and um, what we've got right and I guess more technically what we've got wrong. He didn't posit a lot of answers. That's one unusual thing the books does is it does, uh, you know, Romero wrote a lot about the downfall of humanity, but it didn't write much about the reconstruction of it. Um, so that's a unique thing that the book starts to go into in the third act. Um, so yeah, his, his, his DNA is sort of all over Zebulon Finch, but it's harder to make specific um analysis without looking at the book again it's been so many years and just you know we have a shout out um for rotters from the audience yeah. as well so <laughs> yes thank you all right any other questions from the audience if not, I will hand it over to you, Dan. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, one more. What, Daniel? What's your favorite non-zombie Romero film, and mm -hmm. why? And why? <laughs> um, this sort of my 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 brain and my heart answer. My brain says Martin, which was Romero's favorite film of his, and is very arguably his most perfect movie. Uh, Martin is a, is kind of a a small independent masterpiece. Um, but the truth is, I think my favorite non-zombie Romero movie is Creepshow, which was one of his bigger efforts. Uh, big, splashy movie stars in it and everything. And after Night of the Living Dead, I think it's the movie that, you know, influenced me the most. Like I just saw it at the right age and it scared me and delighted me. And it's just like, I, I never, you know, there are some, there are some times where I wouldn't want to watch Night of the Dead. It's, it's sort of emotional for me, especially at the end. And it's, but I would watch Creepshow right now. <laughs> like, like, it's, it's like, it's a long movie, but I'm, I mean, I'd watch it right now and then yeah. watch it again. I mean, I just, I never get sick of it. It's such a great. Form. I remember growing up in the, the Bernie Wrightson adaptation that they did. Oh yeah. I used to see that in the bookstores all the time. I think well after it was still in print, well after the film was kind of had its heyday. Yeah, that's I, I remember love that one. <laughs> it's a great comic book adaptation, and yeah. I remember I rented it from the rented it. I loaned it from the library as a kid, and I remember my grandpa uh, reading it out loud to me. It's a very <laughs> fond memory. What do you think of the TV uh, version of Creepshow, or, or have you caught up with it at all? Yeah, well, I've written a couple episodes of oh. it, so I'm not completely like <laughs> un unbiased of it. Um, but I think I think it's really interesting, and it's getting stronger and stronger. Yeah, like I think I the second it. season was a huge leap over the first. I I think the third could be a, a leap over the second. I mean, I think the the really and that's like a lot of TV shows and a lot of anthology shows. It takes a while to get the everything working, you know. Uh, but I think it's I think it's moving pretty. Uh, pretty nice to go. Yeah, I agree. It's awesome. That's yeah, great. Well, um, 
up. Any other questions? I want to just thank everyone for coming and spending the hour with us. Thank you, Daniel, for your time and writing the book and bringing us a little bit closer to George Romero's uh, ultimate vision and also the, that timeline of how to watch the watch the movies and read the book at the same time. I think it's going to be invaluable to a number of us. And Colleen, wonderful to see you. And thank you again for agreeing to do this. And look forward to uh, our upcoming SIF meetings whenever those start up again. <laughs> uh, thank you again, everyone. And uh, good night. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel.